And, uh, and the, the title you put down was not, I mean, it's not wrong, because I'm going to be discussing various issues about explaining human action. But I want to concentrate on uh, reductive modes of explanation, actually two which are not the same but are very often operating in synergy. And I want to raise the issue about these, and I obviously stand uh, very hostile to both these. <laughs> but I won't be mainly laying out the arguments today for why they're wrong, but trying to understand how they work, how they convince people, how they sometimes work against each other, sometimes work for each other. So there's two kinds of reduction I want to talk about. And reduction one is the form that you see, for instance, in a certain kind of maybe vulgarized Marxism. And the microphones aren't working. OK, some of these are purely for recording purposes. I think this one is the one that's operative as the PA. Does this, that sound right as I move it? OK, so, <clears throat> so I'll stay close to that. All right, so th that you see it as a vulgar Marxism, in other words, which takes the various human goals splits them into two and ranks them very differently. On one hand, you have the goals that have to do with human life, making the means to life, human reproduction, the kind of goals that we share with all sorts of other animals, on one hand. On the other hand, you have other kinds of higher goals, that so-called higher goals that arise in human culture, moral aims, ethical goals, aesthetic judgments, and so on and so on, right? And the, this kind of reduction undercuts the second class in favor of the first class, and that in two ways. Number one, when it comes to the issue of explanation, there's a kind of explanatory reduction. I mean, famously, the kind of more vulgar kind of Marxism says what actually moves history, what actually explains why history changes and new modes of production arise is the, the the value that they have uh, as modes of production. And then we can explain why different ideologies, different religious views, different legal systems come into place because they subserve the development of this new mode of production, and therefore that's why they're happening. So the, uh, if you like, our human beings' intrinsic interest in these religious or moral or, or other doctrines is given second place in the explanatory framework to these basic, let's call them, life goals. And another way in which the reduction occurs, which weaves into the explanatory reduction, is to allow that the kinds of things we are responding to when we're seeking the life goals are real so we're factors in the world. And the kinds of things we think we're responding to when we're seeking the so-called higher goals are not. They're some, in some sense, projection. So when people alter their mode of production because they find that they can produce more and more people can survive and so on, they're plainly, in doing that, responding to a reality. There really is a <clears throat> greater chance for human life and greater means for life involved in this mode of production as against that. But when people respond to a certain way of living because it's allegedly ethically higher, this is not responding to something as it were really there. This discrimination is not anchored in reality, but it's something that is projected by themselves. They have this, guy, this sense that they feel this way or they have a sense that this is the case. They feel this way either because human beings just always do as a matter of brute fact, or they feel this way because in, in cert certain accounts, being members of this society and this mode of production, they find themselves drawn to it because it's, it's as it were, favoring and helping along this mode of production. Right? So you have both explanatory reduction here. The real explanatory motivations are at this level. But you have also another kind of reduction in which, now I want to introduce this word meanings. This word I want to introduce not in the sense of linguistic meaning, but in the sense where we could speak of the significance of X for me, or the significance of Y for me, or for you, and so on, the, the meaning it has in my life. I prefer meaning to significance because for some reason in English, the word significance doesn't pluralize well. It's significances. It sounds terribly like jargon. And I like to tell myself I'm not using jargon, but of course we all really do. You know. 
<clears throat> so I'll use this word meanings, right? So let's look at that again from the standpoint of, of meanings, that a certain alternative way of organizing production is better in terms of the sustaining of life, that's the meaning it has for them, it's something that's better because it sustains more life, this judgment of meaning, this perception of meaning, is perception of something real, it really does. I mean, it's not something that they've invented, it's not something just a matter of how they feel, it's not something that, that they're projecting on the world, it's something that is really there that they have recognized. But that is certain mode of life, that of uh, contemplation of philosophy or the citizen life or what have you, is a higher mode of life than other modes. That can't be seen. That There's a meaning there. That the, the life, the theoretical life, let's look at Aristotle, right? The theoretical life is the, in a certain sense, the highest mode for human beings. It's the mode that he says in the book 10 of the ethics is the closest to the divine, right? <clears throat> this perception is not a real perception. It's not as if we're grasping some reality there. There isn't an objective fact of the matter that shows the theoretical life to be higher than other modes of life but it is something you have to explain itself in terms of the way in which human beings feel, maybe in this society, maybe in, in general, but it has to be, as it were, explained. They're, they're projecting that superiority onto this otherwise you know, inert reality is something you have to explain. See, there's a matter of meanings that are ultimately projections, meanings that are real, real perceptions. When you get them, you get them right, and you can really show that this is the this meaning really inheres in things. No? In this mode of production, it really has the consequence of allowing more people to live and, and survive and so on. And that's something it really has. In the other case, it's something projected. Now, let's look at the evolution of this kind of reduction in our history. And I want to look at it very quickly. I want to look at Aristotle. I want to look at you. <laughs> and all this in order to extract very quickly a kind of typology of different kinds of meanings, some of which are clearly simply, as it were, projections on our part or things that we just happen to feel, and some of which are plainly uh, meanings that we really perceive and that you can get right or wrong, and that if you get it wrong, you can tell people why they've got it wrong, and so on. So the typology of different kinds of meanings. And let's look at the, just, I mean, this is a terribly rapid thing. I just want to use Aristotle for a few seconds, Hume for a few seconds, <clears throat> and a couple of other references to set up this typology, which we can then, in a certain sense, play around with. Because a, a lot of what, I mean, first of all, a lot of ethical discussion today really turns on whether on where in this typology you situate you know, the important ethical insights. And uh, then, I mean, I would, could go off into that, and that would take us three or four hours, and it would be fascinating. But I want to not do that in order to connect up to another kind of reduction and see how that works together with the kind I'm just describing now. So let me, I'll, I'll try to go through this relatively quickly. All right, let's take the first model that I'm taking is that of Aristotle, Plato. And there in the ethical writings of these authors and others like them, you have uh, certain modes of action together with the motives implicit in them, which are picked out as objectively higher than others. And they're all, this is the object of a strong evaluation. So Aristotle's theoria, that is contemplation, that is the, the disinterested, if you like, contemplation and understanding of the, uh, of the world, of our lives, and so on. Or Aristotle again, the life of the citizen participating in the government uh, together with other citizens of the polis, as against a lower form, the life of the householder, which is, of course, also important for Aristotle, also essential. You know, so we're creating the means to life for the family. 
of course, higher again than the life of simply the one who uh, enjoys uh, you know, drinking a lot of wine, particularly if they don't cut it with water and so on, uh, etc. So you get a hierarchy there. And the belief is that uh, this hierarchy is objective and it is the task of reason, logos, it is the task of reason to discern this. And as a matter of fact, of course, Plato and Aristotle have a lot, actually there are tons of empty spaces that I see here. If you, I mean, if you like sitting on the floor, I, mean, I don't want it, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not paternalistic. I won't make it a virtue of sitting on a chair, but <clears throat> just if you want to, they're there. Well, uh, so these are, these are these, it is the task of reason, and even you might say with Plato, it's clearly how he thinks of reason as the capacity that we have to discern this kind of order, this kind of ranking. But then, of course, there are other examples. You have a I mean, Christian view of agape, of, of charity. Plainly, that is, I mean, one of the theological virtues, right? See where the, worst, the word virtue comes in very easily here. It's seen to be intrinsically higher. Or you think, I mean, in more contemporary terms of some people thinking of their career. And some people might think, well, I really want to be a composer, a writer, an artist, because these are really, really significant careers. You know, I, Dad wants me to go to law school, but etc. You know, so you get that that kind of judgment. See, this is the sense that this is something really more important, or it may be in the modern day personalized because of the modern notion of identity. This is for me what's really important. But, but in, in these, this kind of discernment is what I'm talking about as model one. It's the kind that you can still model on the ancient philosophy. I mean, Plato and Aristotle type of of, um, of structure. And it follows, of course, here, very strong sense that you can get it wrong. There's an objective correctness here, right? And that the whole Nicomachean ethics is meant to take you from, I mean, Aristotle's method is to lay out at the beginning all the things that people think are the good life. The good life is a word for, for this, you know, this higher uh, or the proper ordering of one's different goals. He takes takes you through a whole lot of arguments to get you to see that if you thought that it was simply a life of pleasure, you thought there was simply a life of money making, you got it wrong. That isn't, can't be it. Let's come to the point where you can see that this is the right uh, order. Now, at the, I want to in the end have four categories, which I might even rush up and put on the board in a minute, but I don't know if that's uh, conceivable, uh, technically conceivable. At the very antipodes of this, idea of this meaning, the meaning, let's say, the meaning for Aristotle that the contemplative life has as the highest, most divine mode of human action, the very opposite of that is something like, I had to use an example like this, but I, uh, I find it very useful, the, the notion, the meaning of the nauseating. I mean, certain things just nauseate us. Uh, say this in a four-letter word, but let me say excrement. No, just human beings find nauseating. This is at the absolute antipodes, clearly, from what Aristotle thinks is the status of, of the theoretical life. It's just a brute fact that we find, and not even all of us, but that some of us, most of us, find certain things nauseating. You can perhaps Train yourself, understand in the army, people wade through in the Marines, pigs' guts, and so on, in order that they won't throw up when they're in the battlefield, etc. And you can actually train yourself not to be nauseated. Okay, so then it's not nauseating anymore. Right? There's, there's no real underlying fact of the matter. You're not wrong. You can't be, if you don't find it nauseating, you can't be convinced. Hey, listen, think for a minute, ponder. You know? Don't you see that that? No, it's just a brute fact, right? So we have. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a set of meanings which are impervious to reason. You can't be talked into or out of them. You can deviate from the majority in your perception or non-perception of them. You find you're terribly trembly, you find a lot of things nauseating that people don't, or you're terribly tough and you find a lot of things nauseating that people, uh, perfectly okay that people will find nauseating, okay. You're not right, you're not wrong, you're just different. See, it's just a brute fact. Okay. Now, somewhere between these two extremes is situated a modern theory which 
I think really was most persuasively launched by Hume. I'd like to look at that now. And this, uh, this immense amount of ink is spilt about this, and I'm sure I'm going to offend somebody in the hall here who says, that's not what Hume meant. And I mean, probably you're right. But anyway, I want to make Hume mean something. Anyway, experimentally make Hume mean a certain thing, which it gives us a clear contrast. Now, Hume does seem to be kind of an anti-Aristotle. Because it, I, I'm taking from the inquiry, he's much more brutal and upfront in the treaties. And of course, was it because the treaties was a flop? And, and uh, Anyway, or did he really change his mind? Let's forget that. Let's just take the inquiry. Okay? And he poses the question very early about the foundations of morals, quote, whether they be derived from reason or from sentiment. Reason or sentiment. Now, his first answer is that both seem to have a case, because we do argue about certain moral issues, about right and wrong. But on the other hand, it seems that, I'm now going to give another quote, the final sentence, it is probable, which pronounces characters and actions amiable or odious, praiseworthy or blamable, that which stamps on them the mark of honor or infamy, approbation or censure, that which renders morality an active principle and constitutes virtue or happiness and vice or misery. It is probable, I say, that this final sentence depends on some internal sense or feeling which nature has made universal in the whole species. Right? Now, what seems to be being said here is that the ultimate ultimate, as it were, judgment on which this all hangs is a, just a sentiment, just how we feel, just how nature has made us. In a way, at that level, it's like nature has made us to find certain things, nauseating nature has made us to find certain things approbatable, I mean, approvable and certain other things condemnable. Now this, so this seems to be a brute fact about us. I mean, the notion of brute fact is a key concept here. And it's not the deliverance of reason that we, let's say, approve virtue and abhor vice, as it seems to be for Aristotle. But this sentiment is not like our reaction to nausea, because it's directed towards certain human qualities. And we sometimes need to reason in order to determine whether these human qualities exist in a given case or not, whether they apply to the case or not. Um, so, the actual Hume seems to make a contrast case to morality in this regard when he looks at what we call aesthetics, judgments of beauty, because he does say in this same discussion, some species of beauty, anyway, some species of beauty, especially the natural kinds, which on their first appearance command our affection and approbation, he talks there are, there are some, and where they fail of this effect, it is impossible for any reasoning to redress their influence or adapt them better to our taste or sentiment. So these particular judgments, it would appear, aesthetic judgments, we have this beautiful landscape. It seems to me he's saying there it's rather like the case of nausea. That, you know, ordinarily people say, wow, it's the Grand Canyon. But if somebody says Grand Canyon, mm -hmm, I mean, you know, hole in the ground, then you can't say anything to them about that. But, but he does want to make the contrast, note here, between the uh, moral and the aesthetic. This, I mean, this is interesting because, of course, Hume's, the origin of Hume's position is Hutcheson and the Scottish moral sense theory. And Hutcheson re uh, rehabilitated, in a certain sense, as a specific kind of feeling, the moral sense. But he also rehabilitated as another specific kind of feeling, the sense of beauty, the aesthetic sense, right? So you have Hume, and he, they were equally given a kind of good status by Hutchison, and Hume you find already distinguishing them. So he says, in order to pave the way for the moral sentiment, see, as against this aesthetic one, and to get a proper discernment of its object, it is often necessary, we find, that much reasoning should precede and nice distinctions be made, just conclusions drawn, distant comparisons formed, complicated relations examined, and general facts, facts fixed and ascertained. So we have something 
intermediary between the nausea case and the Aristotle case, where there's a foundation of just basically that we approve of certain things, but where we sometimes have to argue a great deal about whether the object before us really belongs to the class that we approve of or, or disapprove of. It may not be obvious at all, and you may have to go through all these things that he mentions here, comparisons, complications, and so on. So um, what, what do we then admire as a matter of fact? What do we approve? Well, Hume, when he turns to examine this question, takes the example of the, he calls them benevolent or softer affections which whenever they appear, engage the approbation and goodwill of mankind. Again, another quote. No qualities are more entitled to the general goodwill and approbation of mankind than beneficence and humanity, friendship and gratitude, natural affection and public spirit, or whatever proceeds from a tender sympathy with others and a generous concern for our kind and species. Now, Hume speaking here about what is entitled to our approbation. But I think, and here's where Hume, Humeans are going to disagree, he's here speaking with the vulgar, is where he's offering an expression of a common sentiment. The word entitled here, you see, really rings Aristotle, right? I mean, this, you know, this is the right thing to approve of. But I think he, he's really offering an expression of common sentiment. And for Hume, this sentiment can be explained as a joint creation of two other motives, and two other values we universally share. And one is what he, what he calls utility. That is, whatever conduces to life, to health, and the fulfillment of non-harmful desire in human beings, that is something which is useful. But it isn't only our own utility. The thing is that we are endowed, in Hume's view, with sympathy. So we have this reaction to whatever conduces to utility in general, not just for me, but for people in general. And this, he thinks, is the Hutchesonian special, special mode of feeling, which he, like Hutchison, thinks is phenomenologically distinct. I mean, we, we sense that there's a difference when we are moved to approve this wonderful, generous action somebody else has done, just quite different people. I mean, we even do this back in time and think that so-and-so who lived in the past can't have any effect on us, was a very generous person, or, or another, another Nero was an awful tyrant, and we approve or disapprove. And we have the sense that this is a different kind of feeling from the anger I have when you take my purse or you, you know, <clears throat> et cetera, rob me, et cetera, and, and, and so on. He's following the, the Scottish tradition. Now, just because it's the real occurrence of benevolence and not simply the, the semblance of it, there's always room for argument. You see, perhaps the philanthropist is actually weaving a scheme to get somebody in, under his control and is just giving out you know, goodies in order to do that. Or perhaps we see somebody taking a knife to someone else and we say, stop this cruel man, and it turns out to be a surgeon taking out a dangerous tumor. So we can be corrected. Our first off reactions can be can be corrected. And Hume is a very, I mean, you I get sucked into this, you get very interesting because it's wonderful sort of exhibit A of the development of the 18th century concept of polite society and the sense of having moved to a further stage in human development from the ancients. So he's, there's a wonderful passage in the inquiry where he, say, he points out the ancients, he says, disapproved of, quote, luxury or a refinement on the pleasures and conveniences of life, unquote, because they thought this to be, quote, the source of every corruption in government and the immediate cause of faction, sedition, civil wars, and the total loss of liberty. And this is certainly true. I mean, you were Cato, and you can hear Cato <clears throat> uh, inveighing against the, the corruptions arising in society. But, says Hume, we moderns, who now attempt to prove that such refinements rather tend to the increase of industry, civility, and arts, regulate anew our moral as well as our political sentiments, and represent as laudable or innocent what had formerly been regarded as pernicious and blamable. In other words, if you read my colleague Adam Smith, you will understand 
that the search for luxury has a quite different role in our society and helps to not only produce prosperity, but it also helps it helps us to get out of the world in which war making was the major virtue, right? and rather peaceful production, peaceful exchange is the major virtue. And you see, so what he sees here is that this ability for reason to change our moral, our, our sentiments of moral approbation is something that operates as well in history. We have, I mean, what really is underlying this, we have come to discover that the search for luxury is not necessarily harmful, it's not necessarily undermining human good, on the contrary. And when we've done that, then there's no problem, we find no problem in, in our feelings switching as well, and we can even argue with each other about them. So if usefulness, therefore, be a source of moral sentiment, and if this usefulness be not always considered with reference to self, it follows that everything which contributes to the happiness of society recommends itself directly to our approbation and goodwill. Here is a principle which accounts in great part for the origin of morality. And what need we seek for abstruse and remote systems when there occurs one so obvious and natural? Hear that, Aristotle? What need we to search for these abstruse systems when we, there is one that's so obvious and natural? It's obvious that, the, as it were, the importance of utility and the sympathy that we have with each other produces this sentiment. And a footnote to this passage adds, it is needless to push our researches so far as to ask why we have humanity or a fellow feeling with others. It is sufficient that this is experienced to be a principle in human nature. We must stop somewhere in our examination of causes, and there are in every science some general principles beyond which we cannot hope to find any principle more general. So this is a stopping point, see? There's no way you can go beyond this and say, well, the reason why we value human happiness is that it's important because of da Which, of course, you could do if you were Aristotle, of valuing the good life as he un understood it. So the positive value of utility needs no explanation, and sympathy is a brute fact. Uh, <clears throat> so the, what we have here is reason, but reason with a different role, and that means it's also reason of a different kind, where, it, where the ancients had this notion of reason as the power to discern the hierarchy of goals. Now reason is really what we, which we would call instrumental reason. It's the issue of what actually conduces to human happiness. Right? We saw that with luxury. I mean, you find out that the common belief that they had that this actually undermines human happiness and well-being is wrong, or at least in certain circumstances wrong, and we are realizing those circumstances by developing modern commercial society. I mean, it's more complex than simply a, a sort of general rule. But we now find in our circumstances that that is not wrong. We find that uh, instrumentally the search for luxury is actually something which can be harnessed to everyone's benefit, and therefore we switch. So reason is a quite different kind of thing. It's not the discernment of hierarchical order here in ends. It is, the, it is really instrumental reason. And therefore we get the picture of Hume, which I think is fundamentally right, but which people argue about, that he says over, over and over again, reason is not itself a motivating force. Because what he means is that X causes Y is not a motivating force by itself. But if you value Y, then it is a motivating force. Or if you did very much disvalue Y and want to avoid it, then this fact, together with that valuation, will move you. So it is not reason itself, the role of reason being restricted to instrumental reason, which does the moving contrast Plato, right? On the contrary, the perception of this being higher is something that deeply moves you. As a matter of fact, Plato would argue that you haven't really seen that reason is higher unless you love it. I mean, if you say, I guess reason is higher, but you know, take me back to the to tavern and so on, then you haven't properly grasped it. To grasp it properly is to be moved by it. You see, it's totally different construction. And now, this is, I just want to just look at this for a second longer before I 
jump to the other side of the uh, of the attempt tonight to look at the other kind of of, um, of reduction. This, of course, goes along with a complete reorientation of our understanding of what ethics is all about. In a sense, what Hume makes morals about is our perception of utility in our, for ourselves and others, and we respond to that. So it is really, morals is all about how we treat each other, or to use a quote from Tim Scannon's book, what we owe to each other in a certain sense, right? Morals is about that kind of question. The paradigm question for Aristotle and Plato was what's a really worthwhile life? And they derive how we should treat each other from their understanding of what a worthwhile life is. And we have, there's a kind of agreement in a lot of contemporary discussion to divide these two questions and they're sometimes called ethics and morals, respectively. I mean, think of Bernard Williams, think of even Habermas has come around to using this, this uh, language here, right? Morals being the issues of how we treat each other and ethics being issues of what really a good life is. And so we find that some of the succession out of Hume involves splitting these two and saying, well, we can make morals fairly exact uh, not, not exactly science, but I mean a, a study where we can get really clear answers, you know, what does conduce to the general good. But when we come to ethics, what people consider a good life, well, that's something everyone does for themselves, and there isn't a right or wrong here. I can't tell you what to do, what to be. You can't tell me what to be. And we even have a d further development of the kind of Kantian. I mean, in a certain sense, Kant is overturning Hume, but still, in an important sense, downstream from Hume, because he considers the set of issues of how we should treat each other to be central, and you, you get the answers to them out of another kind of reason, which is universalizing vert rationalité, right? Not instrumental reason, but value reason. So, but it's still not the reason of the, uh, of the ancients. So we have a whole lot of absolutely fascinating uh, issues here, and let me therefore lay out these, actually, there are four possibilities. If I don't put them on the border, I'll, I'll put, we can't, anyway. Okay, I'll, I'll lay them out quickly, and then if, if you're all confused, just forget them and remember to only two. I mean, there are, so you can lay them out in a kind of system from different kinds of meanings and how they are either really commanding us or demanding something or just simply de facto what, draws us. So at one end, you have the nauseating, right? They're totally at one end. There's another interesting thing people discuss here, which are classical secondary properties. You have, you know, that um, it's clear that my perception of red, I hope I'm not uh, colorblind, in these uh, chairs here is something which you, you judge to be right. So it's not like nauseating, because you can judge it to be right or wrong. But what it is to judge it to be right or wrong is simply that people with normal apparatus, normal perceptual apparatus, say this is red, and that is some kind of light blue, and <clears throat> et cetera, and this is well, whatever it is. And that's all that it means. So in a certain sense, it's very close to nauseating. It's just how people de facto react with this proviso, unlike the nauseating one, that we can say that people that deviate from these judgments is some problems that they have. But if they were normal, they'd get that. So this is, these are two in one end of the spectrum. Then we get this Hume-derived uh, category, which is very interesting because there, there is an issue of reason. There is an issue of getting it right up to a point. You can be corrected. And it can be said, look, your sentiment of rage at that poor innocent doctor who's taking the tumor out because you thought this beast was a, you know, was a, <clears throat> a cruel monster, your sentiment of disapprobation or rage at him is really totally wrong. It's inappropriate. Now listen to me and I'll tell you what was actually going on, right? So up to a point, this can be corrected. But it can only be corrected through uh, instrumental reason. I'm telling you that this knife there was not there in order to inflict pain on him. It was there in order to save his life, right? So <clears throat> take that in and change your, your judgment. But the reasoning, as it were, the, the uh, 
normative reasoning doesn't go all the way down because it stops at the point where I show you that it conduced to his utility. At that point, if you want to go on asking, well, why is that important? The answer is, I mean, you know, sorry, you, you are just not a normal human being if you can ask that. And <clears throat> this is not something we can go on talking about. Whereas, in the fourth case now, the Aristotle-Plato case, we have this idea that the reasoning can go all the way down. That is, if you ask, well, why is this goal, theory, or what have you, a really valid goal, then we can give you reasons. Reason can show that. There's no where reason simply stops by saying that's where it stops. In a way, the way Hume stops us by saying, we've got to stop somewhere. got to be a principle somewhere, he says. Um, and you, you, some, any, any science you arrive at a principle, you can't get beyond. And the principle we have here is that it's utility and general utility, which draws people's approbation. Well, that's not allowed for in this fourth category. <laughs> so there is, if you like, nausea, vision of color, Hume, Aristotle. We see these four categories. And before I go on and look at the second half of this, and I hope I'm not going on too long here, the you can see that this plays a tremendously important role in ethical life today. I mean, take ecology, take the fight to keep the planet from being destroyed and so on. Now, on one level, this can be argued out in terms of, well, look, if the, all the glaciers in the Himalayas melt and there is, uh, as it were, the, the Ganges and the Mekong and the Yangtze River dry up seasonally at some point totally, you know, a lot of people are going to suffer. And if the Liver, if the level of the sea rises and Bangladesh is flooded, you know, a lot of people are going to suffer terribly. And that's certainly very important, and we can argue on that. And this is Humean type of argument, right? But uh, you note around you the ecological movement. There are lots of people who define themselves as deep ecologists, for instance. And they aren't denying that the first reasons are important, but they're saying they aren't, aren't enough. And they're saying what? Well, they're saying properly understood. Our existence in this environment, in this earth, and so on, is something that makes demands on us, that objectively calls on us to behave in a certain way towards it, to respect certain of its crucial features, to shore them up, not to destroy them, and so on. Right? A certain demand is made on us. And here, someone reasoning in the human way can't really take this in. I mean, they can say, well, okay, we can understand that you feel that way. We can even maybe promote this to something everybody is supposed to feel, you know. But, <clears throat> but it's just, again, we can take that in as a brute feeling, but not as a perception, a correct perception of what is really important here. So when Thoreau says, what is it, in wildness is the preservation of the world, is this, what, any Thoreauvian here can tell me what the word was. Anyway, in wildness is the whatever of the world, this was meant to be an actual perception of some reality, which other people don't realize. And it might be, you know, well, I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> I feel that way too. That could be the response, but that wouldn't be giving, doing justice to this. So this is a very, very crucial issue that we're still always discussing. Okay, what's the second kind? I mean, there's all sorts of issues. I'd love to go on about this. Maybe we could in the discussion, which is, um, I mean, one of the things that bedevils this is that the historical modes of this, these ethical views, take Aristotle's theory, Christianity, what have you, the examples I gave, all give a very profound set of reasons why that kind of reasoning is right. I mean, for instance, Aristotle ultimately is grounded in this notion of the forms as what makes the world as it is, what makes human life what it is. And of course, Christianity is grounded in a certain notion of our relation to God and so on. And people say, well, we don't buy that anymore. Um, but it's, it's interesting. I don't think that that settles the issue. I mean, the very interesting issue is, should we go on arguing this way even if we don't know yet or have an idea yet or have an agreed idea yet what the deeper reasons are? Nevertheless, should we go on considering 
some perceptions of the form, this is a higher good than that, legitimate and, and true. That's the issue, and we could go on about that. But first of all, let me look at the other kind of reduction. The other kind of reduction is a pure explanatory reduction. And it's an attempt to explain human life and action which we normally consider in terms which involve purpose and people's understanding of their own situation, their purposes and their understanding of their own situation, explains why they do this or don't do that and so on. That kind of explanation, which makes use of, just to speak sort of rapidly, what you might call teleology, purpose, and intentionality, their understanding of their situation. Allegedly, some people hold, the proper, deeper account which can be given of this is in purely efficient causal terms. In other words, what is going on here is a sense that the Galilean Newtonian revolution in natural science showed us that our explanation of physics and nature and so on ought to be carried on in purely efficient causal terms, that <clears throat> purpose and so on is not, uh, has no place here, which it very much did for the and the pre-modern notion of uh, ways of explaining the world. And this applies to our explanation even of human beings. And you, I'm now having my, as my sort of paradigm cases here, moving down from Aristotle and Hume, people like Dennett and Pinker that I've been reading, and just right. And the argument is something of the following kind. I mean, either you go along with Descartes and you think that there really is beside the physical universe surrounding us, something totally spooky and ghostly called the mind or the soul, right? Or, if you don't do that, then you have somehow to accept that what you're now hearing from me, which may sound sensible or nonsensible, but it's meant to be logical and so on, is something that can only be emanating from my mouth because I have a brain and a nervous system and a <clears throat> certain amount of experience and the way this is set up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So either you're a dualist or you're not a dualist. But if you accept that it's something to do with, I mean, my saying all this is not some disembodied mind speaking, but something to do with the way my brain is working and so on, then brains, they're, they're matter. Matter has to be explained in terms of efficient causation. So the explanation has to be in terms of efficient causation, QED. In a certain sense, I mean, you can see that there is a big, big argument going on in which I'm on the other side because I'm a, you know, a great follower of Mel Ponty, and I think that this notion of our being embodied beings is the absolutely correct notion. But it's very interesting that we Mel Pontians have a totally different sense of the word embodied than do, let's say, Dennett and, and Pinker and so on, because we think of embodiment as the the fact that we live in the world as embodied beings, that we live in the world with a sense, the sense of the world that comes from being the kind of beings we are, that some things are up, some things are down, some things are easy to reach, some things are very far to reach, and that, that this embodied sense and sensibility is crucial to our lives. And we can't even, we, we don't even have the possibility of more distant and disengaged ways of dealing with the world unless we live, are already living in this engaged form. It's a totally different notion of what embodiment means because it's embodiment of a live, active body with purposes and goals and so on, as against embodiment seen purely in terms of the causal level, the causal mechanisms that uh, underlie this kind of, of, uh, of action. So in a certain sense, from our point of view, there's a massive slippage in the logic of this. I mean, they start off with the Cartesian view that there are these two kinds of things, minds and bodies, and but they follow Descartes. They agree totally with Descartes, in, and Descartes would totally agree with this. When it comes to bodies, it's only, it's mechanism which counts, right? I would say, okay, René, that's fine. So we agree with you totally. We just want to throw the mind out, right? And so we have <clears throat> embodied beings but understood purity mechanistically, and of course this doesn't follow. But it's very interesting to read them because they, they, they never really face that. They just assume that, and I heard, just heard Dan Dennis speak a few months ago, it's exactly the same thing. You know, 
if you don't explain your conscious reasoning in terms of all the little uh, well, the little sort of gremlins there that are dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber, that, then you're not materialist, he said, looking horror and delicious. Then you have some spooky stuff in there. Then, you know, it's not science, right? So anyway, so you have this very powerful view. This is another kind of reduction. This is a pure explanatory reduction. And the kind of claim is made, well, you may think that the reason why uh, know, Obama said this yesterday and so on was that he's figuring out that <clears throat> if you can get some more Republicans on side, if you, et cetera. But no, I mean, the real point underneath is that this is some kind of computer here, and wheels are running, et cetera, working it out. And it can be understood, can be understood on this deeper level mechanistically in the same way that a homing missile or my computer can be similarly understood. There's a very profound difference in, in what life means and so on that's involved in this. All right, but if you take that line, you can see that you're locked into the, the other reduction as well. That is, the reduction that says there are no meanings which can be shown to be validly holding meanings right to the very bottom, as it were. There are only meanings that are meanings for us because at some level it's brute fact that they're meanings for us. <clears throat> These two reductions can come apart because you think of certain kinds of Marxists who would at least partly have bought the first reduction, but who famously said, I mean, you hear these people, Lukács and others at various times, talking about mechanistic, they're, they're materialists. We're all materialists, they say, because these, these are two kinds of people that call themselves materialists. We're all materialists, but these other bourgeois uh, thinkers are mechanistic materialists or bourgeois materialists, and we are dialectical materialists, or, or historical materialists. So they seem to be taking reduction one on board, but not reduction two, right? But what I'm saying is the logic of the arguments is that you couldn't do the, the opposite. I don't see how you could do the opposite. If you take reduction two on board, you want this mechanistic reduction, you have to buy into the debunking of any, if you like, intrinsic meanings or meanings that are meanings all the way down or meanings that can be argued for as objective and so on. At some point, you have to uh, simply stop and reinterpret them as brute facts that we, that we simply desire. You can see this because if you look at the way in which the, this kind of reduction is, is attempted, really which is using computer theory, partly with some help from connectionism and so on, in order to understand our intelligent performances as kinds of computation, right? You see that uh, they can, if this, if this explanation were actually to work, a computer model of the human mind were actually to work, you could see how they could recuperate three of the four kinds of meanings that I laid out here, which I didn't put on the board, right? They can give a perfectly good explanation of nausea. I mean, as it just triggers this off, they can give a very good explanation of why the normal human uh, perception of color comes out with, with the answers it does. They can give a perfectly good explanation, supposedly, of why we just, it's wired into us to find that what creates human suffering is something we don't like. What creates human well-being is something that we we react to. We can, uh, po you know, positively. We can even give certain. I mean, take the whole selfish gene idea, the Dawkins selfish gene idea. You see, this is something that can explain why we have super sympathy for some people, for kin, and not for others. I mean, you know, you know, the idea is that a gene that a gene, of course, operates with a whole collection of genes that form an organism, but the, a gene that makes it more likely that that whole collection will reproduce itself in the next generation will itself, of course, be more widely spread in the next generation and so on and so on. So you get the famous idea of the selfish gene, which is a very bad, 
very stupid uh, uh, image. I mean, a, a metaphor which constantly, they keep saying it's not a metaphor on the next page. They obviously are taking it uh, totally seriously. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, they say, they say, admit it's a metaphor, and then they begin to take it totally seriously. But you can see how this, this works, and this can even explain why if people get, as a matter of fact, a cathexis on their uh, kin, and therefore do all sorts of things for the kin that they wouldn't do for others, and even sacrificing themselves, well, yeah, this will produce a situation if, you know, why didn't Haldane say I would sacrifice myself for four cousins and six or aunts or whatever? <laughs> no, you can see how this pattern, according to their way of calculating, would spread the gene wider. See, so all these things can be explained. But what couldn't be explained is the perception of real intrinsic meaning. Why? Well, because if this isn't a real issue, what is really higher, really better, and so on, then in cases of non-delusion, in cases where I'm not deluded, it would have to be the case that some things falling under the category of really meaningful, really good, etc., would draw me. In other words, it would have real causal power in those cases, the real causal power of drawing me towards it. But this is an impossible property to fit into a mechanistic account, account in pure efficient causation, right? Because how could a property of really fitting a certain normative concept be uh, one that, as it were, allowed the entities uh, instantiating it to have this, this constant causal power? The only thing that could have a constant causal power is something that is just brute connected, something of you know, X or Y that is operative and powerful because it is brutally cathected, and then it would be so. So in order to recognize the efficacy of this kind of discernment, you'd have to translate it into the other kind. You have to move it from the Aristotle category to what I'm calling the Hume category. Right? And then you can do everything else, supposedly. See? Because if you allow all the, <laughs> you allow the computer model of the mind, all kinds of instrumental reason can be coped with by, and according to this mechanistic account, then consciousness really gets that a little bit. But then they divide it up into three things. Consciousness is, in one sense, self-consciousness. So some notion of the self figures, and well, that could be in a computation. And then another element of it is the conscious planning, and if that's instrumental reason, well, that can fit supposedly into the explanation. What can't be fitted into is raw feels or sentience. Well, let's forget that for a moment. And, and, but they think they can get everything, but what they can't get is intrinsic value. As a matter of fact, there's something even, I have to read you this last thing from Pinker, the, uh, how the mind works. There's a certain pathos in this. It comes to the end of the book, and he says, I, you know, I've got this theory, which is a mixture of sort of computer causal account and a evolutionary account. Wow, I mean, you can't get more. And it shows exactly what, how the mind works. And it really can explain everything. Now, there are just a few things I can't fit into this. And there's a list of six. Consciousness, the self, free will, <laughs> meaning, knowledge, and morality. I mean, apart from these <laughs> trivial questions, it's all explained. Anyway, but <laughs> so that's where I want to stop because I've gone on too long. I've tried to show how these different kinds of reduction feed into each other, or in some cases against each other, in the case of certain Marxists. But in our present climate, very much they're working in synergy with each other to make, in various ways, the idea of, as were, intrinsic meaning really unthinkable, I mean, impossible, right? So this is the situation that we face. This is what we have to argue about or argue against and so on. But I wanted tonight to try to put it all, put the strands together. So let me stop there and let's have a discussion and see what we want to go into, what we don't want to go into, and so on. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Tremendously kind. Thank you.
So, so how should we do this? I mean, do you want me just, yeah. I'll just, you want to, or do you want to recognize it? <clears throat> Hi, everybody hear me? So the question is how robust a notion of objective correctness do yeah. you want to defend uh, on the, sort of in the Aristotle box? Yeah. Because just to give you two options, a weak view could just be that, say, beliefs or attitudes uh, admit of truth or mm -hmm. falsity. They can be true. Stronger notion would be that there's something more robust like knowledge to be had. Yeah. Uh, there could be experts who really know, that is, a lot of people could really rely on the experts to know what's really true. Uh, so just those two. I mean, is it just that truth is possible or that oh, uh, there can be no. knowledge experts in about these uh, truths? I mean, experts has the wrong ring because we think of them. I know this. <laughs> you have the same experience. People say to you sometime, phone you up in the hospital, are you an ethicist? Oh, sorry, are, are you an ethicist? And you know, we have an anesthetist on the board, and, we have, and they've got the wrong model. I mean, if you're Aristotelian, which I am, it's a totally wrong model. But so if, if that's what expert means, no. But there are people who are wiser than others on some of these issues. Yes. So in that very strong sense. So there's knowledge, if not this kind of more refined expertise. But his knowledge is not the kind of um, easily communicable expertise, or at least the difficulties in communication of this expertise are diff different from those of the expertise of a, an institution or someone who's going to tell you what stress tables are when you're building your bridge and so on. It's a different kind of knowledge. Now, one of the big differences, I and mean, this is what I would get in the this, in this other part of the talk I didn't give, one of the big differences is that you get the other kind of expertise by disengaging, emotionally disengaging from the area you're studying. You study the stress tables and so on. And you can't let your aesthetic uh, feelings or be part of the, uh, the equation. But you don't manage to get a really good sense of what's really humanly important without, you know, being moved in a certain way by, um, <clears throat> by the situations and by the various objects that, that you're judging, which is why it was always po it's always been possible to read this just in a human way. I mean, just a sort of brute cathexis. But it, a more refined uh, psychological understanding of how human beings operate and how reason operates here, I think, really undercuts that. That's why it's a very different kind of expertise. I mean, if somebody spoke to you in a kind of robotic tone of voice, like, you know, Dr. Spock or something, uh, in uh, Star uh, Trek and so on, and on say, I want to tell you what the highest form of life is, you would find it impossible to, you wouldn't find it credible. But if somebody speaks with a certain amount of fire and, and you think insight, it is credible, because this is a different kind of knowledge. It's not something that can be, <clears throat> it can be disengaged from. Yes, I mean, there are all sorts of, oh. Yeah. Yes, um, I'd like to ask um, why um, do you think that uh, this notion of intrinsic value um, remain, is actually the only thing that remains outside of the possible reductions that you have um, identified? I mean, the notion that, I mean, the ancient notion of finding a, a, an objective value in life um, seems to depend on an objective description of the world and uh, of our place in it. So I guess it's legitimate to think of Aristotle giving us a story that could be uh, amenable to a reduction of this kind. So. It so happens, as a matter of fact, that uh, we as human beings um, are structured in such a way that for us, happiness means theoria. Um, I mean, 
there is nothing either spooky or not reducible about that in a sense. Um, it's just a fact about human nature. So I, my question, I guess, is simply, why is it the case that the notion of intrinsic meaning, as you were describing it, um, simply rules out uh, a completely, uh, if you want, also a mechanistic view of the world and of human beings in it? No, you could give a uh, quasi-mechanistic account. I mean, I want to say again, <laughs> say it the last time, I don't buy for a minute that they even get as far with their reductions as they claim to get, right? But if you give them that, they don't have room for it. Let's take this Theoria case as a very good case, right? Well, when Aristotle's talking about it, he's talking about a pursuit of knowledge, the kind of knowledge where you understand it as being higher which means that the kind of knowledge you're seeking and the kind of issues you're dealing with right, are those which are really central and, and important. Now, you could say, well, it's a fact that human beings are curious. Right? I mean, they just want to know certain things. Right? And as a matter of fact, even the first line of the metaphysics could be read this way, human beings desire to know. Right? Um, but this would be uh, this would be in a way of accounting for a certain amount of human activity which Aristotle was also trying to account for which didn't recognize here an intrinsic meaning but people carrying it out would be carrying it out in a different way because in virtue of the intrinsic meaning for for those who are really you know interested in science there are all sorts of there's a whole ethic of how you carry it on and what's, what's really important and what's cheating and what's not cheating and so on, which follows from this. See, that's the, um, and that is something which follows from understanding this as an intrinsic good. So it's always possible to explain something like the pattern, which Hume does, as simply a brute fact. But it's a different thing when you're trying to make the discriminations in how you carry it out. See, and you claim that certain discriminations of how you really properly carry it out are better than others, which can only be claimed as against, I just feel like carrying it out this way, and you feel like carrying it out that way. No. The claim is higher, then that has to be justified by something like intrinsic meaning. So I'm curious, um, the message I'm walking out the door with is that this would be where psychology and philosophy part company to a certain extent, um, at least physiological psychology and manifestations of what I would say more bottom-up processes leading to higher order reasoning. Is that an accurate characterization well, of what you're saying? Well, who's psychology? I mean, there are various theories in psychology. Yeah, a lot, of psycholo a lot of psychology would part company with this, but a lot of philosophy, I mean, a lot of philosophers have bought into this. You know, Dan Dennis, a philosopher, yeah, mm -hmm. he totally bought into this. So I don't think it's, um, we're talking about two disciplines or subject matters and so on. Okay. We're talking about two very powerful strands that oppose themselves right through the academy. You go into the political science department, you go into the sociology department, you go into the psychology department, the linguistics department, the philosophy department. You can line up these people against each other. And they may be differ differential numbers. Well, but re related to that, I would say reading, rather than Pinker, reading uh, Antonio Damasio. Yeah. Uh, have, have, have you read uh, Damasio's? No, I've read you know, some okay. things of him and so on, but he doesn't seem to be on the same wavelength with these other people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not in the same wavelength. Yeah. yeah. Right. He, Which is an example much... of, I mean, how in the same you know, yeah. disciplines. Okay. Now there's a, a couple of hands way back there, but there's a keel as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to run around. <laughs> Uh, 
back in the in the intrinsic meaning Aristotle box, is there any limit, or would you say that there is some kind of limit, whether it's a procedural or a formal limit, to uh, argument or disagreement within that box? <laughs> well, I mean, how would the, what would a limit look like? Uh, well. Um, uh, uh, um, proponent A says on some question, this is the uh, basic value, the basic good here. And proponent B says, no, this is the basic good. And they have to have some common reference to a standard. Is there an infinite regress of standards? Or, do, or is there some sort of formal Kantian whatever yeah. Rule. Well, I think that that misconceived the question. I think is not. Uh, it's a question mal posé. You see, because I think how this kind of argument works. I, this is the way I see it. That I say, well, our, you know, theory is very important, and you say something else very important, and then we start talking about human life, and it's the whole understanding of human life within the context of that we hope to make our case. Right? Or, or maybe not referring to the whole, but arranging around within the whole to pick up relevant arguments, right? So that we can make our case. It there isn't a point where it stops. I mean, you have a model of argument that um, why a well b b proves a why b well c c proves b. If if you're arguing deductively like that then it has to come to an end somewhere, or else we drop dead. It's an infinite right? regress, yeah. What's that? Or it's an infinite That's right. Regress, yeah. but, but nobody in their right mind argues about this kind of thing that way. You see, what they, <laughs> they don't say, well, I got a knockdown argument about theoria because theoria is ping. You say, what's good about ping? Well, it's pong. No, that's not the way. It's an attempt. The argument is really, it's hermeneutics. It's an attempt to give an interpretation of the whole of human life such that it jumps out from this, if you see it that way, and I can convince you to see it that way, that that is supremely important and not something else. So it never, it potentially never comes to an end. I mean, there's not a, it's a kind of expanding universe in a certain sense, which never, you never reach the outside of it. Deductive arguments are really not in their place here. You know, Aristotle only used them uh, after, as it were, after this hierarchy had been established, right? Then you can use, you know, the, the practical syllogism operates there. What, what do I have to do? I have to do the courageous thing. What's the courageous thing? And so on. Then you, yeah. But, but in order to, I mean, the Nicomachean ethics isn't, as a whole, which is trying to get you into seeing the good life in his terms is not a deductive argument. And it doesn't work that way. So, you see, I think that the, this is just a very incorrect model for what's actually going on. And maybe a little bit infected by the by Kantianism, Kant. K1N1. I mean, uh, um, you see what I mean? That you can think that you can get these absolutely clear and knock down arguments. Like, you know, could you universalize this maxim? Right, right, no, right, so yeah. it's wrong. Well, okay. <laughs> but then that itself you can't get going unless you, <laughs> you can convince me anyway about something about human beings that I presently don't believe. Um, I, sorry. To, <laughs> okay, go on. I, I think down. then that your the... the infinity of the argument or the endlessness of it has yeah. an historical dimension, that is to say, relative to this cultural framework. We have these interpretations and we come up to the limit of the cultural framework and go outside it to some well, next framework and next work. Yeah. And, and yeah, so in that sense, you are returning to a kind of historical uh, uh, relativity, not we hope the vulgar Marxism, but a no, more well, complicated. No, you, you could. I mean, it's possible to make a judgment. Well, you know, Aristotle wasn't so wrong in his society, but when you look at it now, uh, and some of those judgments are, I think, correct, but other judgments 
wouldn't allow for other judgments about other things that wouldn't allow for that. But you're right, the whole historical record is there, I mean, as far as we know it, to allow you to argue both these. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it's endless. I mean, it's potentially endless. We ne may never convince each other, but the, and it's, but the endlessness is a good endlessness. There's always somewhere else for the argument to go. You see what I mean? It's, yeah. yeah. Good evening. Uh, I want to start off by declaring that I am lean uh, towards Dennis' line of view generally, um, but I'm trying to wrap my head around some more of some of the other sides of things. In particular, I was wondering what insight you could offer for someone who is uh, who also rejects dualism, um, but still may not be grounded in uh, the neurological systems to the extent that Dennett is. I, I've struggled seeing where someone would lie in a position that rejects dualism, but still manages to, to reject Dennett as well. Yeah, I reject dualism and reject Dennett as well. That would be my position. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, I think that the whole Cartesian idea of a kind of disconnected mind and so on from the body doesn't make any sense. But the big issue is what are the concepts, terms, etc., in which you have to understand us as living beings. And can you really sideline totally, if you like, uh, teleology and intentionality? And I think you can't. As a matter of fact, I think it's such, it's in some ways an immense proposition, an immensely implausible claim to think that you can. And you have to issue a lot of promissory notes that we're going to be able to explain this and this and this, you know. I mean, quite a, there are all sorts of things that don't really go very well with it. Like, for, for one thing, the most people who know something about how the brain, you know, more or less organizes itself in early life, etc., really reject the computer model totally. They say this is a real mistake. People like Edelman and Jean-Pierre Changer in France, and you go on and on and on with the whole list of them, they find this really wild. They don't think that has anything to do with how we operate. So the, the whole set of promissory notes here are very far from being redeemed, let me put it that way. But I mean, you know, we won't know till the end of the argument if there ever is one. Thank you. Chuck, uh, just a question about the de the deafness on the part of um, of people like Dennett and so on yeah. for the Merleau-Ponty version yeah. of uh, the embodied subject, uh, uh, seeing it's always in their version of it. Yeah. Uh, one diagnosis of of it might be that. There really are two distinctions, one between uh, the body and mind, yeah. and the other between the point of view of engagement and the point of view of sort of detachment. Mm -hmm. And the idea of Merleau-Ponty's idea of an embodied subject is, is really the idea of, um, of the body which is actually engaged because yeah. it has, right? So it sort of scrambles the distinctions. It won't allow the two distinctions to coincide. Yes. Complete, right? Um, and and if, if that's right, it looks as if the fundamental distinction by Merleau-Ponty's lights and, and your lights, and, and I guess I agree with this, is that the real distinction is a point of view distinction or, or a point of view dualism to some extent. That, if there is one. And one could happily uh, reject the other uh, dualism. And, and Descartes was partly responsible for this because he insisted on treating subjectivity as a substance, right? And so he created a sort of objectivist orientation of, of you know, detachment, etc. Uh, and it's really Husserl and all who later insisted on the point of view dualist thing. Uh, but I'm, this is really following up on the last question. Um, I'm curious about uh, P. 
people who are prepared to say, say Davidson, for instance, and a number of others, who oppose the mechanistic view, you know, that Pinker, Dennett, and so on, and are prepared to say the subject is enchanted, that it, it is a site of normativity and, and value and, and so on, norms which is irreducible, so can't be seen in mechanistic terms, etc. But there's a sort of shallowness by the lights of this Aristotelian picture you've been talking about. Uh, th th there's a shallowness about it because it leaves all the enchantment in the subject, right? And doesn't have a, uh, a sort of corresponding uh, sort of objective meanings, as you put it, or values or, or whatever. And, and that leaves the very idea of enchantment incomplete or, or shallow. In fact, I don't know if it even so much as makes sense. Um, uh, without it, and, and it's interesting that if you leave it that way, then you can have a picture in which you people are keen to totalize one or the other point of view. So you have Dennett and all completely totalizing the d detached third person, but you have somebody like Sartre, who tends to totalize the the, the subjective or the the first person point of view, saying, you know, well, we don't really learn about ourselves from psychoanalysis, that's all bad faith, and so on. You know, it's really a pretense, it's all subjective anyway, you're just pretending that you, uh, uh, so, so really you don't get the deep thing, you don't get Aristotle's uh, point unless you see the two enchantments as it were depending on each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I think there's a deep um, connivence, you say in French, I mean a deep sort of, uh, in, they're in cahoots, these two standpoints, right? the extreme standpoints. There's a very interesting line in Pinker in which, of course, people gave him a lot of trouble about his uh, evolutionary psychology and so on, well, you're, aren't you buying into sexism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, it's totally untrue of poor Pinker. He, isn't, you know, he doesn't feel that way. So they say, well, I mean, if you have all these, uh, <clears throat> you know, genes obviously in you that are pushing you to behave in a, to, uh, as a man in a totally sexist way and so on. Um, what do you do about that? And he said, well, I just I tell my genes to go jump in the lake. But that's a very interesting <laughs> remark because suddenly you have entre, almost a Sartrean type of you know, radical choice here. But why do these things, they do fit together, you see, because if you, that whole objectivizing standpoint implicitly puts the subject in a situation of incredible control and domination, which, of course, is sometimes an invitation to a totally technocratic approach, right? You know, we really understand this, we're going to advise governments, and we'll be able to organize the world, and, you know, you know Skinner thought we would get totally rid of alienation altogether if they just had nobody brought up by their parents, you know, if we bring up all the kids, said, okay, so we be more bonkers than we are today, but, but you know, it can be that kind of total control, or it can be, well, I'm totally master of my own house. I decide, my values tell me not, so I'm going to control this. There's a kind of flip between these two, which is easy to do because there's an, an, an underground uh, sympathy between the two. I mean, uh, what's the word for connivance? I mean, there's an underground, yeah, they're in cahoots, underground, between the two. How would you characterize that space between the two, um, especially with um, a consideration for the subject um, as an object? Could so, you come close? Yeah, sorry. How would you characterize the space between the two with the subject as an object in terms of perhaps ideology or perhaps um, ways in which the subject, I'm not sure, isn't completely capable of understanding its own intention, uh, um, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think there has to be a kind of distorted self-understanding. Sorry, I'm doing the same thing. There has to be a kind of distorted self-understanding. You see, in, if you think that you can totally understand yourself from that third-person standpoint, and you has to be a devaluing of the kinds of intuitions on in which we all live in actually carrying out our lives. <clears throat> and, um, but people can, you know, people can live in a kind of split-level way. 
I mean, I once knew a friend of mine who had a friend of his who was, uh, they're both rational choice theorists. I mean, a friend was saying, oh, God, it's a terrible decision. I mean, this woman I'm with, well, she wants it to become more serious, and, and do I marry her or not? And so his friend said, well, let's settle the matrix. And uh, he said, no, this is serious. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, life breaks in. You know, see. <laughs> Any more questions? So, thank you very much. <laughs>